I want to start by asking a question. Your favorite trip or vacation you've ever been on? Quickly, share it with the person next to you. Favorite trip you've ever been on? Favorite place you've ever visited? What is that? One of my favorite trips was one of Lisa's least favorite trips. My favorite trip, her least favorite trip. Let me tell you about it. We decided we were gonna go to the Rocky Mountain National Park in Northern Colorado and hike as a family. If you haven't been there, absolutely stunning. Uh, moose and deer and mountain caps and meadows. It was absolutely amazing. That was the best part. The worst part of that trip was we drove. Have any idea how long it takes to get to Colorado in a van with small kids all under the age of seven? Any idea? Um, I mean, it wasn't terrible for me. I love driving. I absolutely love driving, but um, we had two major problems. Number one, very quickly, the kids got bored. Now, I have, a, I have a question. In fact, it's a quiz, actually, for anybody that's in the room that's under 22. Raise your hand, okay, if you're under 22. I'm gonna show you a picture, and I want you to tell me um, what they did there. You ready? Go. Here's the picture right here. <laughs> Any idea? Any idea what they did there? This is a place where you, didn't, you couldn't get videos on your phone, right? You, went, you actually rented them and you would take them. And so on this trip, whenever we would go on long distance trips, this was so janky. This, I would go and get a milk carton and I bought a small TV and somehow got a converter where you could plug it into the electrical socket. And I took this TV and I took ropes and attached it to the back of seats. This is before like cars actually have like video players in the back of the headrest, right? So, so we did this and then the kids had, had watched all of the videos twice by that point. And that was the first problem. The second problem was because we were going to the Southwest, this is the first time we had gone to the Southwest as a family, I made a commitment in honor of it being the Southwest, that I told Lisa, I'm only gonna eat breakfast burritos for breakfast. And that's what I did. On day one, what did I have? Breakfast burrito. Day two, breakfast burrito. Day three, breakfast burrito. Day four, you know where this is going. Day five, Day six, do you think I quit and rested like God did on the seventh day? No, I did not. I went all the way through. And is there a particular food that doesn't agree with your stomach? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and evidently uh, breakfast burritos don't agree with my stomach, which wouldn't be a problem unless you're in a van all together for 10 days. So somewhere around Colorado Springs, uh, we had to pull into a Walmart and get hazmat suits. And uh, that's what I love and Lisa didn't like about our trip to Colorado. Okay, so we're in this series called The Sacred Path and you're probably wondering, what does The Sacred Path have to do with breakfast burritos? I'll tell you here in a second. So we're talking about these songs that ancient Jews would sing when they would go from their homes to Jerusalem. And they were sort of like the Spotify playlist. If you weren't here last week, these are psalms that start in Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134, 136, I believe. And they're pilgrimage songs, and they're songs that you learn from your grandmother and your grandfather and your aunts and uncles. And whenever you hit the road, you would start singing them out loud right along the way. Someone's carrying a beat, someone's carrying the tune, people are harmonizing and riffing and all like we do today and that sort of thing. You're just having fun, you're singing these songs. And these songs were later called the Psalms of Ascent. And these are songs for pilgrimage. These are songs for people who need to see God do a new thing in their life. They're songs for us. Now, you so see you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the breakfast burritos here? I wanna show you a map. This is a Google map that will show, this is just the route that Jesus would have taken with his disciples going to Jerusalem. There were obviously places where you would go much longer, so you would go from Capernaum, you would go down the Jordan River Valley, 
And can you read this, how long it would take to walk 37 hours? So how long would it take you to go from Capernaum all the way there? At a min minimum, it's two days of straight walking, right? But it's, it's more than that. It's more complex than that. What would happen if you then had small kids with you? How long would it take for you to walk for 37 straight hours? What if you also had grandma with you and your elderly aunt? What if you were carrying a lot of your food? What if you had tents that you were carrying to sleep in and your animals needed to rest? What, ter what was a two-day uh, trip would have quickly turned into, my goodness, five days, seven days, a full week? And so I've hiked this area before, and so Jerusalem is 2,400 feet in elevation, which is as high as any mountain in the Poconos, and to get through them, you have to go through the Judean foothills. And the Judean foothills are like hiking through the worst parts of, let's say, the Lehigh Gorge, except it's 100 degrees, there are uh, desert rattlesnakes everywhere, and bandits that want to murder you. And so that's what you have to do. So I guess what I'm trying to describe for you is how many of you have been super excited, you're going on a trip, you're getting into the van, you're getting into the plane, and you're going somewhere, but quickly that trip, <laughs> that trip fell apart pretty quick. And you got, you got at each other's throats, right? A vacation that you're excited about, you're with extended family, so the Jews are traveling with people from their synagogue, people of the Jewish nation, and it just turns ugly very quickly. A pilgrimage turns into a mess. And so you can understand why in Psalm 133, so I'm not gonna go in order with these Psalms, I'm just gonna go around at different themes. In Psalm 133, you understand why it was written. It says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Uh, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the beard, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So the first thing I want to point out about this is that on your pilgrimage, you're going to be tempted to lose your cool and you have to remember that in our relationships, God expects unity. God expects unity. Jesus' last prayer were that, was that God's people would be unified. Uh, it, the early church was like they were in one accord. They were together, right? And so the, the psalm is telling us to remind ourselves how good it feels. Have you ever been in, like, in a workplace where like everybody's all like at their each other and behind their backs and stuff. And then you go and you're in a workplace, you're like, oh, this place is not like that. These people actually enjoy working together. And it's not by accident they work hard to make it happen, but that's what he's saying. He's like, I want you to remember when you're on the road and it's 100 degrees and there's nothing to drink and grandma is annoying you and the grandkids are annoying you, grandma, and like all of that. You just have to remember how pleasant and good it is when God's people live in unity. Now, Verse one says that, and then the Greek word for good is the, or I'm sorry, the Hebrew word tov. It means healthy. And in fact, the Genesis chapter one, it says, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was tov, healthy. It felt good. You ever been in a relationship that just didn't feel good? You know, you're like, I just don't have any peace about this relationship. If you're sitting next to that person right now, just, just point to them right now, if you could do that right now. Right, and that's what this is saying, is that this is the exact opposite, that when you feel peace and you're good in this relationship with this person, that is called tov, right? Um, we know what tov is in Hebrew. We know what it feels good in a relationship when, because we know it's exact opposite. On Instagram, I shared this post. I just... I don't know, Lisa and I have this saying, right? And so um, it, it goes like this. It, it, it's, we just fight for your marriage even when it's painful, even when it seems hopeless, even when others tell you to quit, right? You fight for your marriage even when it's painful, even when it seems hopeless, even when others tell you to quit. That, 
we're always going to be the couple that's going to tell you your marriage is worth fighting for. That's going to, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not even going to say that you're going to save your marriage, but it's worth fighting for. So I just put this little post up on Instagram, and like, people just keep commenting over and over, can you pray for my marriage? Can you pray for my marriage? Can you, here's this situation, and he's done this, and she's done this. Here it is. Um, and that feeling of, man, I want this to work, and it's not working, is the absence of Tov. And any of us, all of us that have been in relationships, we all know what that's like, right? We have all been in relationships at times, even if they're good today, where they weren't Tov, they weren't healthy. So the psalmist says, I want you to remember as you're traveling, when it's hard and you're at each other's throats, how good it feels. Here's how good it feels. Number one, it feels like lotion on cracked, painful skin. Do you have a lotion that you put on during the winter? I have this theory that men don't need lotion, <laughs> right? My wife, a liberal applier of lotion on the skin. What did people do for thousands of years without this lotion? And so. About one time in the winter, maybe two times in the winter, we'll be in bed and I'll be rubbing up against her with my cracked elbows and she'll go, oh, stop it, give me the elbows, right? And then she'll go and she'll, she'll start rubbing and actually when she does it, I will very quickly give her the other elbow, right? Because it feels really good, right? Because honestly, yes, my elbows are cracked and that sort of thing and it feels really good. In the ancient Near East, you would use first press olive oil and it would be running. So it says this in verse two. Unity, relationships that are healthy and feel good, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, this was the priest, down on the collar of his robe. In other words, this is expensive. But man, how good does it feel when you don't have to worry about cash? and you're hurting all over, and so you just douse it all over your body. That's what it feels like to be in good, healthy relationships. The second thing that unity feels like is unity feels like fresh, cold water and 100 degree heat. We read the Psalm and we pass right over where it says, it's as if the dew of Hermon, and we're like, who's this guy named Hermon? It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, for there the Lord bestows his blessing even life and forevermore. Hermon actually isn't a, a man's name. Hermon is a mountain. Her Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel. And you gotta remember, this is the day where you didn't have Wawa's, and so you either took your water or you drank water out of the Jordan River, which during these feasts would be very hot and very muddy. Have you ever had a drink of dirty creek water, right? With a good stomach full of E. coli, mmm, 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 mmm. But if you take fresh snow-packed melt coming down from Mount Hermon, which actually supplies all of the water for Israel, which is why they try to defend Mount Hermon and the Golan Heights, because if they lose that, they're losing their water supply, right? And so that's what it's like. You're in the middle of the summer and someone gives you clear, cold water. That's what it feels like to be in a relationship with someone and you feel unity, all right? So here's the thing though. The psalmist is not talking about marriage. The psalmist is not talking about um, family situations. The psalmist is actually talking about the church talking about relationships in the church. How good is it, it says, and pleasant when God's people live in unity. Now this is very, very important, right? Um, the great spiritual writer Dallas Willard says, God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with, his, with himself included as its primary sustainer and its most glorious inhabitant. So what we have to understand that as evangelicals, we don't get the core issue of Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross, saving you from your sins, was a very small part of that. 
Jesus' death on the cross was to accomplish the new community, the ecclesia, the church. That's ultimately what he's accomplishing, a community of saved people who would begin to relate with one another differently. That when we're out of the darkness being brought into the light, it's not just that God saves us individually, and then what we can do is we can partake of different spiritual communities like a smorgasbord, and then we can leave is that he, he violently died on the cross to bring us together in community. We hear the word unity as Americans, and we hear the word feeling good about other people and about ourselves. We feel good. Here's what I want you to write down when it comes to unity. Unity isn't something that's felt, it's something that's made. This is true in a family, this is true in a business. Unity is not an accident. Unity is something that is worked for. It is something that is made. When the typical American goes to church, at the first sign of trouble, what happens? I'm not feeling it, so we need to find another church because Jesus died on the cross for our individual things. And what we don't realize is that he died for us as a community. I have a good friend that left during COVID. Um, that was devastating, honestly. He was a good friend of mine. And he just, I was like, what do you mean you're leaving? He's like, I'm not feeling it anymore. I'm like, you're not feeling it anymore. Listen, someone leaving the family that Christ died for ought to sound as haunting as a mom saying, I'm not feeling being a mom anymore and dropping the four kids off at an orphanage or at the fire station. Like, has anybody left your small group in the last few years? Any team that you serve on? Any Bible study? Your friend group? And the American church, the average church, lost 50% of its people, partly because of COVID, partly because of the divisions that were happening directly pre-COVID with race relations, political ideology fights, all of this coming to a head. And COVID was simply the tsunami that cleared it out. Here's what we have to understand. The American definition of conflict revolution or resolution in the church is this. Number one, if there's conflict, how I handle it is I gossip about that person. And then if it doesn't, if I don't feel better after that, then I leave. Right, we've seen this, right? I, I've done this before. This is not foreign. I mean, when, I'm, when I say typical American going to church, I'm including all of us. This is what we do. We go into a church, we plug in, and if there's an issue, there's a conflict, we gossip, we don't resolve it, and then if I don't feel better, I leave. And so the psalmist says when we do that, when we have a conflict, then we gossip and we leave, it ought to feel like being parched in the middle of the summer and going down to a creek and taking a big gulp of nasty E. coli dirty water. It ought to feel like cracked skin all over our bodies. It's not what God created us to experience. Now, we, why don't we resolve conflict? Why don't we engage in difficult situations? We all know why. We're busy and it's hard. Life is hard enough, and if you view church as a place where you get self-help inspiration, then you'll just go to the next place where you'll get self-help inspiration. But if you view it as a family that Jesus died for, you don't leave family. You don't. Now, I heard someone say one time, before you talk about someone behind their back, you should walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you do talk about them, you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. <laughs> it's not bad advice, you know? That's pretty good advice. Yeah, I like that, right? So here's the problem. When Jesus talks about our mouths, he talked very specifically about how we talk. 
to one another and about one another. He said this. He said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Like if you have a healthy tree, we're getting ready to plant some vegetables and that sort of thing, and you put them in pots and lights and plant them outside. If you do a good job of that, then you're going to see the vegetables and fruit, right? But you make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by the fruit. You brood of vipers, he's saying to us, how can you who are evil say anything you're good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good things stored up in him, and the, man, the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment. I, I wonder if he's using specifically the words men here, um, because men have the glorious ability to be jerks. Did I hear an amen over there? <laughs> I heard an amen. Yes, I did, right? But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every, look at this, every careless word they've spoken. Have you spoken careless words before? I know I have. Like I read this and I'm like, dang. For by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. So Jesus is saying you can tell the condition of a person's heart by the way they talk about someone else. And that we're gonna have to give an account so here's the thing. Unity is not something that feels good. Unity is something that God's ble God blesses. Unity is not something that feels good. Unity is something God is an action that God blesses. Look what it says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. Like, you got crack skin everywhere, man, like you're getting dumped with oil. It's like the dew of Hermon when it's falling on Mount Zion. For there, where is there? For there. For in unity, when God sees unity, people working towards unity, he blesses them. The Lord blesses unity, not feeling unified. He blesses people who say, this relationship is worth fighting for. This relationship matters. So how do we eliminate like this sort of untove, unhealthy sort of like gossip from our community? And it's not just ours, it's all church communities. Number one, we have to recognize that this is a big issue to God. He died for relationships in the church. He died for us and our relationships. Number two, we need to repent. We repent when we become Christians. We repent when we sin. I remember I did an internship. I've shared this with you before. I did an internship, and the internship just was not good. It was terrible, and, but the pastor I was doing it with was like too busy. He never should have had an intern. And, and so I started gossiping about the pastor I was doing the internship with behind his back. And we're at a worship service one time. We took a bunch of kids to a summer camp and that sort of thing. They threw me the keys to the bus. They said, you're gonna drive the bus. I'm like, who, me? I get to drive 45 kids in a bus, even though I've never driven a bus. Anyway, so this was back in the 80s, okay? So I drive this bus, we go to this camp, we're at this worship service. I'm not really paying attention, but all, way, all, all of a sudden I feel God's presence. I felt like I was singing to God. And as I felt like actually God was there and I'm singing, I immediately became aware that I'm standing next to person that I'm gossiping about, slandering. And right in the middle of the service, I leaned over and I said, Russell, I, I am so sorry. I've been speaking behind your back. And we just had like a little chat right there in the worship service. And I said, this is the reason I'm doing it. I'm so sorry, I'm this. And he said, I get it, and this has been a difficult summer for me too. Like, and it was resolved. And, and that is tove. We can't assume that we're not going to have conflict. We're going to have conflict. 
But what is abnormal is not resolving the conflict. You're in a small group with someone, right? You have relationships with someone. And for some reason, I don't know, you don't like a couple or you don't like a person and somehow they feel it and they don't jive and that sort of thing. And you're like, but you never come out and actually address the issue. You're on a service team, right? You're serving with people and there's like an issue with someone and they're controlling and that sort of thing. And then rather than actually constructively addressing the issue, it's like, I'm just gonna bail, right? And what Jesus is saying is like, we have to repent of our course of action. There's conflict, we gossip, we leave. We need to repent of doing that. And so the final thing that we have to do is we have, there's a process for conflict resolution. There's a biblical process and Jesus outlined it. And in Matthew chapter 18, whenever there's a temptation to gossip and then leave, that is an indication that you and I are to go to Matthew chapter 18. And it says this, if your brother or sister sins, go point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if they refuse to listen, tell it to the church, the leaders. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, you treat them as you would a pagan, a tax collector, or a Cowboys fan. So the first, the first is the first step is you go privately to the person. Like if there's an issue, you go privately to the person and you say, listen, you said this or did this and this is how it made me feel and I just wanted to come because I value our relationship with one another and I wanted to work it out. I just didn't want to gossip about you and then cut and run, All right? If your brother or sister go and point out their fault and you work it out together. You don't talk to anybody else. You don't bring it up and have your prayer partner pray for you. You don't go to your group, oh, can you please help? No, 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 you go to the person. The second thing that you do is if that doesn't work, then you go and involve other trusted Christian friends. I was at First Christian Church in Clearwater, Florida. A lady came up to me and said, Scott Einem is such a jerk. He is such a jerk. He was, he was my friend. He was our youth pastor at the time. And he was one of the greatest people that I knew. And I said, you know what? This is interesting because this doesn't sound at all like Scott. Can you give me your hand for a second? And I took her hand. I said, Scott's right around the hallway. Let's go talk to Scott. And she was like, no, 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 no. I was like, no, hold on, yeah, no, Scott's right over, no, it's literally, let's just, I, we can just, no, 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 never saw her again. That's, that's what we do. That's my tendency. I don't like conflict. I'd rather gossip and bail too. But I've just really appreciated the people that are in our community that said, no, 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 our, We've, we've invested too much together. We're actually gonna have a conversation. We're gonna talk about this. So the third step is, if that doesn't work, then you take it to someone in church leadership. Um, uh, when Lisa was a kid at the church where she grew up, there were two people in the church. They went into business together. The business failed, as do the majority of businesses that start. Business failed, they blamed each other, and they were ripe to fire up the lawyers, right? And you know what they did? They came to the leaders and said, we're both disciples of Jesus. We don't wanna litigate this. We want you to help us. And that's exactly what they did. There were some wise Christian male and female leaders that were in the business community that guided them to a resolution. Number four, if that doesn't work, then it says that you treat them like you would a tax collector or a pagan. You just say, I'm gonna cut them off from my life. So what are the steps? You go to them in person. If that doesn't work, you take one or two other people. And if that doesn't work, then you ask the leadership to get involved. And if that doesn't work, you say, I'm done. That is a much better process than conflict, gossip, leave. Why? Because when you do Jesus' approach, it feels like a 
cold glass of water on a winter's day. It feels like oil soothing cracked skin. Relationships are worth saving. Jesus died for our community. And the fact that this is a psalm of an ascent where we're asking God to do something new, one of the things that we need to do new is we need to value the relationships that we have. God, we thank you and we pray that you would do something special in the hearts of people right now. If there's someone that you have brought to mind, maybe it's because we need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. If there's the face of someone that came to mind, maybe we need to go and ask that person, hey, let's work this thing out. You came and you died on the cross, leaving heaven to earth to create this community. Help us to value this community as much as we value ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com. Thank you.